So, this is it guys. A few weeks ago, AMD made some wild claims about the performance of Zen 3. According to them, the Ryzen 5000 series is supposed to be a massive leap forward and improve in some key areas where the previous generation of processors came up a bit short. So that means better multi-core performance where AMD was already super strong, but more importantly, addressing single core and lightly thread situations too. And that should lead to higher frame rates in games. And gaming was one of the last areas Intel could claim any lead. So we set out to test out every one of those claims. And let me just say this, these are some amazing processors and I've never been excited about a new product in a really long time. So allow us to walk you through our experience and of course the performance results and definitely talk about the new architecture right after a message from our sponsor. The new Corsair IQ4000X is the mid-tower you'll appreciate with beautiful lighting powered by IQ Lighting Node Core and new AirGuide 120mm fans for powerful concentrated airflow. The frame is high quality and a pleasure to work with. It's available in black or white and airflow model too. Check it out below. Okay, so the structure for this video is gonna be pretty straightforward. So right at the top, we're gonna to walk you through what has changed with the Zen 3 architecture, and then followed by a quick recap on the Ryzen 5000 series lineup, and then obviously onto testing. So if you wanna to skip to a certain part of the video, I'll make sure to leave timestamps down below. In setting up to design Zen 3, AMD identified three key areas that were needed to deliver the best possible performance across every application, and not just multi-threaded ones. Basically, they needed to boost overall output, but without increasing power consumption. The first stop of that journey was the core itself. Here, they've done things like adding a larger instruction cache, increased overall bandwidth, lowered the latency of integer and floating point units, and a bunch of other things. It would take a whole other 20 minute video to dive into all of this, but let's just say the primary goal was to get instructions through the architecture faster to take advantage of the changes AMD did to their cache design. Like we already know, each Zen CPU is made up of chiplets, which are also called core chiplet dies or CCDs for short. Until Zen 3, each of those dies held two CCX groupings of four cores, and each of those had access to 16 megabytes of L3 cache. The problem was that if data needed to be transferred between one CCX and another, it would need to be done over the Infinity Fabric, and that added up quite a bit of latency, especially in lightly threaded workloads. Zen 3 now combines all the cores within the CCD into one unit with a large shared 32 megabytes of L3 cache, so single cores have access to the full cache amount. That leads to communication between the cores and between the cache and the cores being streamlined in a big way since instructions don't to be moved outside the CCX. Games and other applications like high frequency trading are gonna love this layout. Another possibility is this new design could seriously benefit eight core and lower CPUs like the 5800X and the 5600X since all their operations are done within a single CCD. Meanwhile, the 5900X and the 5950X would still need to offload lightly threaded operations through the Infinity Fabric and IO die between their two CCDs, which would technically increase latency. But according to AMD, actually seeing a negative performance impact from that would be super rare, especially since these higher end CPUs run at higher frequencies, which can offset any latency penalties. And that all leads up to the new lineup. At the very top is the 16 core 32 thread Ryzen 9 5950X, which has a 200 megahertz higher boost clock than the 3950X. We'll be covering that in a completely separate review because it's a beast and it deserves its own dedicated coverage. And that's followed by the 12 core 24 thread 5900X. And this is where things get interesting on some fronts. While its boost clock is 100 megahertz higher than the 3900XT, the base frequency gets a 100 megahertz cut. But the Zen 3 improvements mean that small reduction won't be noticed at all. Moving down, and the Ryzen 7 5800X is being launched to replace the 3800X and XT. What we don't see yet is a clear 3700X replacement, but in a lot of ways, the 5600X ends up muscling into its territory. The Ryzen 5 5600X seems like it'll be a great bang for the buck gaming CPU, and it improves big time over the 3600X. I should also mention, the 5600X is the only CPU in this lineup uh, that gets an included heatsink. And looking at pricing, it's obvious, AMD's targeting a bit more of a premium market for their 5000 series. But the 5950X, the 5900X, and the 5800X still directly replace the 3000 series CPUs. But underneath that, things start to get interesting. Nudging the Ryzen 5 5600X up to $300 allows all the CPUs from the 3600XT on downwards 
to live on for folks building more affordable systems. And speaking of motherboards, that's where people holding on to older motherboards might have to wait a little longer. While B550 and X570 will have support right out of the gate, provided you update them first, the 400 series users will still need to wait until January at the earliest to upgrade their systems to Zen 3. I sort of understand this move because it allows the engineering teams to fully focus on optimizing performance of current platforms for AMD's new architecture. And it also controls the amount of people who will just rush out to buy one of these new 5000 series of CPUs. And hopefully this will also improve availability in the first few months after launch. Just remember though, Zen 3 is a bit of a dead end platform since these are the last CPUs that will be using the AIM4 socket. So if you buy one of these right now along with a B550 or X570 motherboard, you won't be able to upgrade to Zen 4 in the future. Another thing I want to mention is coolers. AMD might make it look like you need to spend mega bucks on a heatsink or AIO, but that's not really the case guys, because every one of these processors was cooled by a Noctua NHU-12S without any problems inside a closed case. As for our test system specs, here they are, and as usual, we're gonna be focusing on real world applications and games rather than load you up with synthetics. Also, I'm gonna be focusing on the original 3000 series rather than the newer XT CPUs, since the performance benefits of those was minimal and they weren't as popular by a long shot. And I wanna start with the gaming results, which is one area where Intel still held a lead and AMD really wanted to address that. We're running these at a more realistic 1080p with the highest details and an RTX 3090, which should eliminate some bottlenecks. Also remember that like you saw in the AMD scaling video, as you use lower spec GPUs or increase resolutions, these results will tighten up even more. Starting off with Call of Duty and right away, it's obvious there's some gigantic performance improvements over the previous generation, but it also looks like even the RTX 3090 ends up being a bottleneck at the high end. Now for Doom, we're seeing another GPU bottleneck, but every one of the AMD Ryzen CPUs is right in line with the 10900K. The biggest story here is the 5600X though, since it offers about a 20% improvement over the 3600X and is basically tied with the other two more expensive Zen 3 processors. Now with Horizon, here we see a game engine that can take advantage of more threats. So the 5900X's 1% lows uh, end up being a bit better than the other two CPUs. But again, there's a clear advantage for Zen 3 over Zen 2. It looks like AMD's focus on latency is paying off here big time. Red Dead Redemption sees a GPU bottleneck come back, but that still doesn't stop the 5000 series from bridging the gap between Intel and last year's fastest AMD CPUs. Moving on to esports, and Rainbow Six seems to favor Intel, but Ryzen is really catching up. But something else I wanna draw your attention to is how close the 5600X, 5800X, and the 5900X are to one another in all these games. You could literally save $250 by going with the 5600X and get almost the exact same frame rates as the 5900X. And now we start getting into some really insane results. I mean, this is just mind blowing guys. It turns out the biggest benefits of Zen 3's ultra low latency designs are seen in competitive online shooters that use DX9. CSGO is one of those and it turns out moving to Zen 3 can give you a massive frame rate boost if your graphics card's powerful enough. The same thing can be said for Valorant where the 5900X, 5800X and 5600X walk all over everything else. I mean, just look at that. Their 1% lows are pretty much equal to the 3900X's average frame rate. That's just insane. Finally, with Overwatch and uh, well, what can I really say about this? Even after a new patch increased the frame rate cap to 400, the RTX 3090 is still more than powerful enough to hit that with every processor in this review. So AMD promised to deliver better gaming performance and that's exactly what they did. And in some cases, it was just mind blowing. You see, in standard AAA games, Intel has to be worried because less expensive Ryzen processors like the 5600X and the 5800X can either match or beat the Core i9-10900K. Just think about that. Intel is probably freaking out right now about getting slapped around so hard in competitive games like CSGO and Valorant. And that's because influential esports players could end up switching to Ryzen for a competitive advantage 
because before they were stuck with Intel. And that influence was something that Intel counted on to generate sales. I'm not sure how well I'm describing this, but it's actually a huge deal. So with that out of the way, I think it's time to get into our usual suite of real world application benchmarks. In order to set a baseline, let's load up the one synthetic we're using and that's Cinebench. So starting off with the multi-core results and geez, the 5000 series processors just demolish everything in these charts by a massive margin to the point where the 5600X is just starting to muscle into 3700X territory, and that processor has four more active processing threads. As for single core, it isn't even close. The difference between Zen 2 and Zen 3 is like night and day. It looks like AMD's special sauce is working like a miracle, but will that actually translate into such huge leads in real world? Let's start with DaVinci Resolve, a program that I use here on a daily basis, and it looks like there are some minimal gains for the new CPUs, but let me explain this a bit more. Basically, DaVinci is a GPU bound program where the processor takes a backstage to CUDA, but the 5900X is still a really good choice. Switching to Adobe Premiere, well, Intel has an advantage here since they can leverage their integrated quick sync engines to accelerate processing times. But, and this is super cool, the speed up from AMD's architecture revisions meant the 5000 series narrows the gap by a big amount here. In our charts, reality capture used to be dominated by Intel since the workloads we use have a combination of heavily multi-core and lightly threaded loads. But now, AMD is able to take that lead without any problems. Now I'm gonna pause here for a few more seconds than I did with the other results because Handbrake really highlights all of the improvements Zen 3 has rolled into it. Seeing almost a minute, and I repeat, a minute reduction in the transcode times of a relatively short 4K video is just insane for one CPU generation to another. If you extrapolate that over a longer 10 gigabyte file, the amount of time saved by moving to a 5900X, 5800X, or even the 5600X is pretty huge. Moving on to compiling, and the lead for these new CPUs is a bit less than in Handbrake, but they're still offering better performance across the board. One of the biggest changes seems to be right at the middle of the chart, with the 5800X really pulling far ahead of the 3800X. Metashape has been one of Intel's strongest programs in our charts, and AMD has made some pretty good progress here with Zen 3. As for Blender, this is a program that really focuses on multi-threaded dominance, and of course, that shows AMD leading in a big way, but that's something that they've been doing for years now. And finally, there's Autodesk Maya, where the 5900X sees a relatively small lead over the 3900X, but the real story is actually happening lower down in the lineup. There, the 5800X and 5600X ended up being a lot better than the previous generation, and that's a big deal for more budget-oriented CPUs. So, what does this all tell us about the 5000 series? Well, first of all, in multi-core applications, uh, AMD's lead over Intel has extended by a big amount. Uh, even in programs that aren't heavily multi-core focused, Zen 3 does give these new Ryzen's a huge advantage, and that really makes it really hard to recommend Intel for anything in the productivity and creativity markets at this point. AMD just seems to have a much better uh, platform and CPU architecture that can just be adapted in pretty much any situation. There's not that much to say about power consumption either, because AMD delivered on their promises here as well. These new CPUs don't consume any more power than the 3000 series, even though they deliver much better overall performance. This year has been pretty busy, especially with tech, but Zen 3, in my opinion, is, it's a game changer. It's got improved multi-core and single-core performance, uh, killer gaming frame rates, and it all manages to deliver within the same power specs just like Zen 2. Yes, they're more expensive than the 3000 series processors, but based on these results, the new Ryzen CPUs are worth every penny, especially the Ryzen 5 5600X for gaming. It's just an awesome value, guys. But would I run out and upgrade my 3900X, 3800X, or 3600X right now? And that really depends. For productivity and creativity apps, there are benefits but they aren't groundbreaking over Zen 2. The same can be said for most games, since the GPU will likely be a bottleneck before the CPU is. On the other hand, for competitive gaming, Zen 3 is pretty mind-blowing. As for Intel, I'm actually gonna cut to something that Mike mentioned about a year ago about Zen 2. Man, it's freaking amazing. Yeah, just imagine what they'll do next year. <laughs> oh, I know, right? right? If they say if they say Zen, Zen 3 is coming out next year, it's, uh, Intel's gonna be in a little bit of hurt until yep. seven nanometer. Yep, 
That's exactly what happened. I think Intel is in a world of hurt right now, to a point where AMD has basically run away with the CPU market. I barely even mentioned them uh, in the benchmarks since the expensive 10 nanometer K really didn't factor into the results. So what's Intel's option right now? Well, they have an inferior platform with slower CPUs that are priced similarly to what AMD is offering right now, and Rocket Lake is only coming out next year. They can't lean on the better and gaming crunch either, since Zen 3 is either matching or beating them. The only thing that's left is to cut prices and hope for a miracle in the short term. And on that note, all I'm going to say is spend responsibly. And in this case, that probably means looking very seriously into Zen 3 for your next upgrade.